So we're gonna, I'm going to pick up right where I left off last week. I'm going to try to, I'm going to finish off last, last week's lecture and I'm going to try to get through most of this week's lecture. Usually it goes fairly well that I can get caught up to where we're supposed to be. And then the lectures all get shorter after this because there's less catch up. So last week we stopped on this slide where it said relationships. So we're going to be talking about relationships. So we have in database design, this is so this feels like such an echo because I literally finished talking about this in my other class before this. Sorry. Um, so we have three kinds of relationships. We have one-to-one -one where each entity participating in a relationship can only exist once. And last class, one of my students came up with a really good example. A one-to-one -one relationship that applies to all of you guys is student, you pass. Each student has one you pass. Each you pass belongs to one student. There's both separate entities, but it's a one-to-one -one relationship. That was a pretty straightforward one that everybody could understand in this group. You have one-to-many. So one-to-many means that you have a relationship between one entity and many other instances in another entity. So a good example, super simplifying how the data actually is, is prof to students. One of me has many students. Each of you have one 8250 teacher. Right? So if we're talking about just this class, it's a one to many relationship. For you guys, it's one to me, but it's one here to many of you. And then you have many to many, where there's a uh, both entities participate into multiple relationships. So going back to students and profs, in theory, I have many students and you guys have many profs. If we ignore just this course, right? You guys are taking what, six classes this term? Actually, for some of you, this class alone is two profs. You got me and you got uh, Way. There we go. Um, so you have two profs for this class. So it's a many to many relationship where I have many students and you guys have many profs. So that's the equivalent of many to many. Now, Many to many is not something you see in a physical database. It is physically impossible to do many to many. Putting it out there now, uh, in case I forget to cover it later. One to one can exist in a database physically. One to many can exist in a database physically. Many to many is physically impossible to create in a database. That's just, they won't let you. There's no such thing. Uh, there have been database products over the year that have allowed it. And every single time that somebody tries to do many to many in a database, it ends up being a mess. I almost used a really bad phrase. It's just bad. All right. So there's also degrees of relationship, and that determines the number of entity types that participate in it. You have unary, binary, ternary. There's actually more than ternary. Um, Urinary means that it's a relationship that only interacts with itself. So it's an entity that refers to itself. A common way of visualizing that would be um, an employee record where there's supervisors. You have Right, you have an entity that's an employee, but you can also have like this, whereas because the employee supervises other employees, you wouldn't have a separate table for the supervisors in your employee table. You would just mark that say this this employee is supervised by another employee. And that's known as a unary relationship because there's only one entity involved. A binary relationship, which is, by the way, 98% of database tables out there, is when there's tables participating. Teacher, student, binary relationship because there's two entities. A ternary relationship when there's three, and after that they decide to stop trying to give it names 
because there's cases you got four, five, or six all participating as a single thing. Um, you could have a developer, an architect, all working on a project. So you'd have a relationship between the developer, the architect, and the project, and that would be a ternary relationship. And if you were in a diagram it, that's how you draw a diagram it. And this diagram is actually really bad because you see this little white box right here? That should be blue. I noticed that last term that this diagram that I've been using for years isn't colored in right. That should be blue. That should be just be a line pointing to itself. But anyways, um, yeah, ternary relationship. And an example of unary, of course, I did it on the board. Fantastic. I don't need to do the slide. Um, binary relationship, an employee works in a department. An employee, in this case, we're not going to talk about what the employee works in one department and they only have one department. Um, and then you got a ternary, which, you know, you want to go a prof course and student. Prof has multiple courses, has multiple students, ternary relationship. Um, and, you know, you can go four, five, six. It, they just stop giving it names at three. Um, then we have cardinality constraints. So cardinality constraints is the number of instances that one entity can be associated with another instance of another entity. So we always add a minimum and a maximum number to the cardinality. And the easy way to remember it, so the minimum is either going to be zero or one. Zero means it's optional. One means it's mandatory. A good example of that for a minimum cardinality would be, uh, myself actually is a good example, as a professor. When they assign me a course, I actually have zero students. They give me the course, and then they load the students in. They, you know, they say, oh, we expect to have 91 students this term in this course. We know we're going to need a prof for it. You've got the seniority. Course is yours. We don't even know how many students you're going to teach yet. So I have a minimum cardinality with courses. It's zero or one. It means I can, I have it optionally have courses because I'm in the system, but I can have at least one. And that would be um, for you guys and your student cards or your, your um, because basically the UPASS is basically mandatory. You don't get out of it anymore. So for you guys, you must have a U-Pass. You sign up, you pay your fees, you are given a U-Pass whether you need it or not, regardless. Therefore, in that case, it's not minimum cardinality of zero, it's minimum cardinality of one because you must have a U-Pass. You paid your fees, you have a U-Pass. You don't get to opt out of the U-Pass. Well, unless you live out in the sticks like in Kempville or in, you know, Winchester or whatever. But realistically, for probably almost everybody in this room, you do not get to opt out of the U-Pass. So minimum cardinality is one. Maximum cardinality is usually one or more. It's worded that way. It's one or more. So again, you and the U-Pass, you're only allowed one U-Pass. So that means your maximum cardinality is one. So you would read it as in your relationship to a U-Pass is one and only one because it's not optional and you can't have more than one. So it's one and only one. On the other hand, your relationship from you to courses is zero, one, or more. When you first register at a school, you are not assigned any courses. You exist as a student, but you have no courses yet. Therefore, at that point, courses is optional. So therefore, the minimum cardinality is zero. The maximum cardinality is many. Bye. Sorry. I was just having a moment. Um, so in that case, you guys have a minimum cardinality of zero, maximum cardinality of many. Because you can have zero courses. And basically put one or more is always many. So often you'll hear people say it either zero, one or more, because that's that's how I'll say it, because that's how I was taught. 
you'll have other people that just say it's zero or more. Because the second it's or more, it implies one, because one is still more than zero, but there could be two. Or three or four or six or whatever. So that's the maximum cardinality. So when we talk about the constraints, we have four symbols. This is known as crow's foot. So when you're going to be learning about diagramming, you're going to be using something called crow's foot notation in this course. There's several other notations. Uh, last time I checked, I think there's now eight different database notations. This is the most common one. And it's pretty much the one that's always used when they're teaching. Uh, unless you're being taught in Brazil, because they use a different notation there by default. It's called ID1 fix. I don't know why, but that one country insists on being different from everybody else. And Germany. And I don't remember, uh, Germany uses another one as their default for teaching. It's just odd, because I've had students come in from Brazil that have taken computers before, and they go, we don't use that notation, we use something else. I'm like, that's cool. So these are the four pieces we have. So we have mandatory one, which would be drawn as two lines. Optional one, which is zero one. Mandatory many means there must be one, there could be more. An optional many, which is zero or more. So when we look at this example, we have a patient and a patient history. What a lot of people have a hard time reading when they're first starting to learn to read crow's foot is the fact that the notation is on the opposite side of the line from the object. So a patient must have at least one record history, and they probably have many records. Each patient history belongs to one and only one patient. So the symbol at that end of the line always refers to the object at the other end of the line. So if you were to cut this line in half, this basically you draw a line from here, from here to here, the symbol at that end of the line refers to the relationship from this object to that object. And at this end, it's the relationship from this object to that object. That's the, when people are learning crows, but that's the one part that a lot of people find interesting to try to wrap their brains around. It's not too bad once you get it, but it takes a little while to get the hang of it. Um, I often see students when they do their first their first diagram in lab where they flip the relationships because they go, well, the patient has many records, therefore they figure that the patient has many, it should be at this end. No, no, it's the other way around, at the other end of the line. Um, here's an example of the cardinality of a one to many. Um, that's a flight, that's the flight attendant. Because you cannot have any flight that has more than seven passengers must have a flight attendant, if I remember the rules. So you can assume outside of very specific flights that there's a flight attendant. Therefore, we, it's safe to say that a flight must have a flight attendant. So this is a mandatory relation. So you got AC123 has one flight attendant. LH456 has two flight attendants. BA231 has two flight attendants. This is a mandatory one to many. So each flight must have one. I mean, each flight attendant can be on one and only one flight. Makes sense. You can't have the flight attendant on two different planes at the same time. That's physically impossible. However, you can have more than one flight attendant on your plane. So one to many. Going one way, many to one the other way. And if we were to draw it with the cardinality, so if we went from this to this, we would draw it just like this. So each attendant can be on one and only one flight. Each flight must have at least one attendant, but they can have more than one. And this is the example of an optional, back to the prof in class, right? I get registered as a prof. I haven't been assigned a class yet. so. For example, August comes around. I haven't been given my course load for September yet. Therefore, I'm in the system, but I have no classes. So it's optional. However, you got some profs that have two classes. You got a prof with one class, and you actually have a class without a prof, because that happens too, where you know they created a new course and there's no prof for it yet. 
or suddenly the ad needed to add a section. And there's no prof for it. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it's saying. Because that's how this example is written. That's all. Realistically, you, yeah, well, this is saying that a person must have at least one record, but they could have more than one. And the record cannot exist without a patient. What optional mean would mean you'd be able to put a patient in the system and they've never seen a doctor. So realistically, like I said, this example might not be the best because realistically you signed up with a doctor, you're going to be added to their patient information system, but you won't have a record yet. But most medical systems, the second they add you, will add a history record saying that's the day you were added. So because every interaction, the second they pull up your record, they must put in something in the history showing that you were looked at. So that's why. That's it. I mean, it could be optional, but realistically. Yeah, that's actual fact. This next one here actually is going to cover that. So this one here is drawn like such. So each prof may or may not have a class because the class is optional to the prof, but the prof may have one or more. So this is right as zero, one or more, or we can go short and just go zero or more. And again, each class can be taught by one prof, or it may not even have a prof assigned to it yet. Therefore, each class has zero or one prof. And realistically, it's we're more like a section here at the college, right? Because you've got multiple sections. But each class can only ever be assigned to a prof, but it may not have a prof yet. When they spin up a new section, that happened last September for uh, 8215. Um, mid-August, they discovered that they needed to create a new section. That meant they had literally had section 600, 700? Section 700, I think. And they didn't have a prof for it yet. So the course existed, but there was no prof for it yet. So the prof was optional as far as that course was concerned until they populated the course. So that's how you'd read this. So each prof has zero, one or more classes. Each class has zero or one prof. All right, so we've almost reached the end of last week's lecture. Um, naming conventions. So in database, naming conventions is actually really, really important. Um, a lot of people really don't understand how important naming conventions are. And it's not just a case of, oh, it's important to give this a name and give it a proper name. It's also how you create that name. Now, you guys should have this fairly not bad compared to my students that take Java because you guys, your first language of the school is Python. This, this is going to feel familiar in a minute. So back in the day, naming conventions used to be loose and free. I mean, I'm talking, it was insane. People did whatever they wanted. There was no conventions. There was no standards. And even realistically today, there's almost no standard. But basically, anybody did whatever they wanted. Um, original space constraint, it used to be very cryptic. Uh, we're talking back in the days of computers that use tape to tape. You know, reel to reel. And you might have ever watched the old movies and you see the reels moving on the computers back and forth and that kind of thing. Or you see like the big computer rooms with the big hard drives. Um, cause I remember my first summer job while I was in college, I was actually a janitor at a different college in my hometown and they were running on an old VAX computer system. The hard drive. I kid you not, the size of this table. It held a whopping 18 megabytes, the size of this table. Right, My phone, that's like two pictures. So when you had space constraints of measured in megabytes, you tended to be very crypt, like, you know, you'd name your table C for customer, and the fields would be like CN, customer name. Blah, 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 because there were space constraints. You didn't want to waste space on the hard drive with pointless stuff. Uh, each company had its own standards. Even 
their own developers could have their own standards for what they decide to call stuff within the same company because everybody just did whatever the heck they wanted. Uh, the company I'm at now, when I started there man, 23 years ago, um, we had three database guys. I came in and I'd look at a table and I could tell who created the table in the database because they all looked different. Each guy did it whichever way they wanted. They had no standards. It was terrible. So it would cause all kinds of grief because then people would look at the tables and not really know how what things are because everybody did their own thing. Um, however, thanks to modern development frameworks, there's a de facto standard that's starting to erupt or emerge. Um, for those of you that don't know what a de facto standard is, a de facto standard is a standard that's generally accepted that has not been written down as a standard. So it's not an ISO 8901 standard. It's not a AAA a triple I standard, triple E, I triple E, whatever. It's just basically, it's a standard where pretty much everybody has done it. Like a, they call it gentleman's, gentleman's agreement. We say, you know, we're going to call things like this and you're going to call things like this and we're all going to get along. And that's basically what's happened. Um, and you know who we can thank for that standard? A language called Ruby. So a few of you might've heard of Ruby on Rails. Ruby's a language, Rails is the framework. Ruby as a language sucks. Rails as a framework was phenomenal. The amount of stuff you could do with Rails without having to actually code was amazing. And everybody ran over to Ruby on Rails because it's so great. And then everybody like in PHP and like that, I go, I can do that too. And Ruby pretty much died three years later, but you know, it is what it is. And Python has its own frameworks too. And so in PHP, we got three or four big standards that are pushing the industry. Uh, you got Cake PHP, uh, Laravel, uh, Code Igniter, and a few others. And essentially, what's happened? And Rails from Ruby follows it. Uh, the standard for C Sharp, according to Microsoft, is almost identical. So these frameworks have all come along. And said, you know, if you name your database objects this way and you follow these naming conventions, the code's going to be easy to write. People don't need to guess. Our ORM can do its magic without you having to actually create any code. It's really cool. So here we go. So this is the naming conventions for, um, you're gonna use on your physical diagrams. Everything is lowercase, no exceptions. Conceptual diagrams is okay. That can be whatever you want. On the physical diagrams, logical diagrams, everything is lowercase, no exceptions. No spaces, underscores. This is starting to sound familiar to how you name variables in Java and Python, eh? Hey, okay, so your object names are basically like Python variables, snake case. Tables are plural when possible. Uh, the only exceptions be uh, when for things that imply plurality, like log. A log, when you say, oh, I'm going to add this to the log, the log implies there's going to be multiple entries in it by default. On the other hand, you would have a table called students because the students table holds many students. The primary keys are called ID, just ID. You never need to guess what the variables are, what the field, the primary key is called if the primary key is called ID. If it's a single column primary key, you'll and you call it ID, you'll always know that it's called ID. You don't need to guess. That you can thank uh, Ruby on Rails for that one. Um, Foreign keys are named using the following pattern. There's a pattern to it. So it's the singular parent table name plus an underscore plus the primary key name. Now the primary key name is always ID. Therefore, it becomes pretty easy. So if we have a table called users, a foreign key would be user ID because it's the ID of single user. Where do you find the user? In users. There's like logic behind this naming convention. Um, there once was a time where, no, that's not how any of this worked, but that's pretty much a de facto standard now. So it's a good time to start getting used to it. All right. We now caught up to last week. Yay. Uh, so close this. And away we go for today. So we're going to talk about diagramming. Uh, this actually, this slide deck has a lot of slides, but honestly, a lot of it is um, I'm not going to go through it quickly, but it's pretty thin. There's like a lot of pictures. So we're going to basically talk about um, terms about 
relationship modeling, that kind of stuff. A database model can be a database can be modeled as a collection of entities and the relationships amongst the the entities. Um, usually, database systems are modeled using an ER diagram. So I'm sure you guys have heard about ERDs. But then you'll hear someone say, "Yeah, I want you to create me an ERD diagram." What they're saying is they want you to create you an ER an ER diagram diagram. The D in ERD stands for diagram, so it's an ER diagram, or just an ERD, and it's basically a blueprint. And there's three kinds of ERDs. Um, I'm sure I'm going to hit a slide with it later, but there's three kinds. There's the conceptual, the logical, and the physical. Conceptual is where you start. That's for the rough draft of the database. The logical is when you refine it. The physical is when you're tuning it to the actual database engine. Because you can take a logical and make that apply to any database engine. The physical would be specific to the platform. So MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, the physical diagram will be different. Very similar, but they'll be different on each one of them because in MySQL, you have certain data types. In Oracle, you have different kinds of data types. In Postgres, you got a third kind of data type, but they all do the same thing. MySQL has Varkar. Postgres has character varying because they like being verbose. In Oracle, you have Varkar too because Varkar is reserved for future use. I don't know. It's just Oracle things. So that's the three kinds of diagrams. So an ER model allows us to sketch a database design. It's a graphical tool. It allows you to look at the structure graphically. Um, it is used widely in database design. Uh, whenever we get a new customer at my day job and we are developing something for them, even though most of the time it's just taking something else and just reskinning it, uh, they often ask for a diagram of the database. And depending on who they're asking, they'll get the conceptual diagram for it, which is very simplified. They may get the physical diagram, which is very technical. Just depends on what the target audience is. Um, and it basically what it does is the purpose is to, to highlight the relationship between entities. So you can quickly see how things are interconnected. So an ERD serves multiple purposes. So as a database analyst or designer or architect, which is also a common phrase, it helps us understand the information that's being contained in the database. So as we create the ERD, it helps us understand the data. And the better we understand the data, it allows us to create a better ERD, which helps us understand the data better, which allows us to you know, you can see where I'm headed with that one, right? You create your ERD to understand what's going on and the understanding lets you make the ERD better. Um, it's a documentation tool. I'm sure you guys have been taught about how important documentation is. I know Jerome's real big fan of markdown files. Uh, you know, um, once you get a job in the real world, documentation never ends. Whether it's a comment on a commit to a repo down to uh, updating a ticket in JIRA, take your pick. There's documentation. You could be putting in a wiki page in Confluence. You know, these are all different tools. It's all documentation. Diagrams go into this documentation. And the ERD is used to communicate the logical structure of the database to users. Specifically, the conceptual diagram is a great way to allow a technical person to explain how the data is related, to each one of the different parts of the data is related to a lay person. So in a few minutes when I start showing you guys, you know, the conceptual ERDs, um, you'll see that conceptual ERDs are fantastic just to keep things nice and simple. If when I needed to explain something to my manager, which was not a database guy, I gave him the conceptual ERD because I go, he could read it. There's not enough extra fluff on there. No, no data types. No, how relationships are set up. None of that. It's, he should just understand that you know, a customer has a product. That's all he wanted to know. That's all he needed to understand. The application developer, on the other hand, he needed the technical one because he needed to know what kind of data to shove in each of the fields. So when we talk about the old style uh, diagrams, we had four graphical components. 
We have a square, a diamond, the cardinality, which is in this case is showing like a weird little plus sign, but it's literally the crow's foot. And then an attribute, which is, you know, would map out to a column is in an ellipse. So time permitting today, I will show you guys a tool to draw these, um, which is fantastic. Way better than draw.io or whatever it's called now. Um, but those are the pieces you use to draw it. So if you need to put an entity on a diagram, well, there's my box, right? When I drew it on the screen, I did one right here for you guys. So if I wanted to turn this around and add attributes to the one I've got on the board, An employee has a name and a date of birth. An employee has zero or more skills. Hope they've got at least one skill. But zero or one more skills. And each skill belongs to at least one employee. And honestly, if we wanted to draw this properly, we'd actually draw it like this. Because each skill must belong to at least one employee, but you could have more than one employee with the same skill. And that is those symbols into something a little more visual for you guys to understand. All right, so classifications of relationships. So optional relationships, which I, you know, basically I just finished talking about. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But an employee may or may not be assigned to a department. A patient may or may not be assigned to a room. That's optional. Anybody here ever gone to the ER and you spend the entire time at the ER sitting in a chair? As a person who, you know, with pancreatitis sat in a chair and then he moved me to a different chair. It was amazing. Never sat in a room. They take you from one chair, so you may or may not be assigned to a room. You might be just assigned to a common area. Um, an employee may or may not be assigned to a department, or they, theoretically, uh, it could be assigned to multiple departments. Mandatory relationship. Every course must be taught by at least one teacher. Uh, that last one's wrong. It should be the other way around. Um, I didn't write this slide. Every time I teach this course, I keep I keep telling myself I got to remember to change the slide. But technically it's correct because you can't be a mother unless you have a child. Right? That's technically correct. It's just not politically correct. Um, a mother has at least one child, otherwise they're not a mother. They're just, they could be an adopted kid, but you know, if they have no kids, they're not a mother. I really don't like that one. Because every time I start talking about it, it makes me feel gross. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, cardinality constraints, we talked about that too. It's zero, one, or more. Uh, this is just repeat, just slightly different wording. I'm going to skip that one. And we talked about the one to many already. So, that's one of the funny things about doing this week's lecture. At this, this week's lecture, I get to skip like eight slides. Uh, but here's the the um, the relationships, right, with, with the different crow's foot. But this one shows it with the diamonds, this. So, this is new. When you have a relationship, what's happening is, do I have a different colored marker? Please. Nope, that's red. That's black. There we go. The issue is that the relationship for this guy is here on this side of the diamond. And the relationship for this guy is on that side of the diamond. So the diamond splits the line. Some diagramming software doesn't support this, so they'll actually draw the line directly. But the it's at the opposite end. So in a model, we want to indicate that each student may enroll many students or may not enroll any students at all. Indicate each student attends exactly one school. It would be read like this without the diamond. So it's the same thing we covered in the previous set of slides. So I'm not spending a lot of time on that, but it's basically the school has zero or one or more students. Each student belongs to one and only one school. Not necessarily at the college level, because I've had students going to Carleton and Algonquin at the same time. Don't know how they manage, but they've done it. 
But high school students, for example, you can only attend one high school. You with you register with the Ottawa Carleton District School Board and they assign you to Woodruff High School, you're not going to be going to Laurentian High School. Well, Laurentian High School doesn't exist anymore, but you know, whatever was Laurentian then. So each student must go to a school and only one school, but in three, a school could have no students. Like the school down the street from me that they is still there, still run by OCDSB, but they no longer send students there. It's being used for training instead. But that school has no students. So when we want to create an ERD, uh, we identify the entity, we identify the attributes, potentially identify the primary, figure out the relationships, figure out the constraints, and drop the ERD, and then check it. Um, these slides have a complete set of examples in it. And this is the process again, but with arrows. So you model your entities and attributes, you choose your keys, create your relationships, cardinalities, and then you check the model. And that's just more of the same thing. Um, now, here's the example. This is where it's all going to make sense, I hope. So, as you can see on here, we got a big block of text. And if you've downloaded the slides, this is a good time to have that slide open in front of you because I'll be moving away from this. I'm just saying. At least, you know, one of you, between three people, share a screen. I don't care how you do it. Um, so we have a big paragraph of text and a company has several departments. Each department has a supervisor and at least one employee. Employees must be assigned to at least one, but possibly more departments. At least one employee is assigned to a project, but an employee may be on vacation and not assigned to any projects. The important data fields are the names of the department, projects, supervisors, and employees as well as we also have to keep track of the employee and supervisor number and a unique project number. It's a very dense paragraph with a lot of information in it. So the first thing we're going to do is identify the entities. So one approach to this is to work through the information, highlighting the words. So if you have this open in Word or you've got it printed out on a piece of paper, I'm a big fan of wasting paper. Um, I just work better with physical media in my hands. Kind of weird for a computer guy, but you know, I like my paper or my whiteboard. And so we highlight the nouns and we only ever pick it. Once we find one, we only use it once. We don't highlight it three or four times. So we go, a company has several departments. Each department has a supervisor and at least one employee. So these are basically things that we've identified so far. Employees, we don't need to highlight that again because we've already identified that we have employee. Let's be least one, but possibly more departments. Don't need to talk about departments. We've picked it. At least one employee is assigned to a project. Oh, that one's new, so that gets highlighted. And then if we go through the rest, you will know nowhere else are we adding any new objects. Now, a true entity should have more than one instance. Therefore, a company has several departments. A company is one thing. It's a single instance. You're not going to ever model the company. Unless you have multiple companies you're talking about. But in this case, we're talking about a company, so we wouldn't model it. So we're actually going to discard the company as a potential target for, mo for modeling. So this grid, this is what we used when I went through school. So circa 1995, a few years ago. Pretty sure almost everybody in here was not around then. Almost everybody, there might be a few that were borderline around. So this is known as a matrix. So you may have learned about matrices in math and other courses. And a really easy way is creating a table like this. So you basically put in all the entities in the same order, right? Top to bottom, left to right. And then you fill it in. And you would go through each cell and you decide whether or not there's an association. So for example, we know the department is assigned an, an employee or an employee is assigned to a department and a department is run by a supervisor and a supervisor runs a department. So we know there's a relationship there. An employee belongs to a department and an employee works on a project. The employee is not related to the employee in this case, because not once did we ever talk about an employee being related to another employee. Um, not once did we ever actually say an employee was related to a supervisor. If you don't believe me, go reread that paragraph. Not once do we ever talk about a supervisor and an employee ever being connected. 
The supervisor runs a department, no other relationship. A project uses an employee, nice phrase. That's pretty much how it is. A uh, project uses employees, an employee is used by a project, and that's the relationships in that paragraph. So then what we're gonna do is um, keep going. Sorry, there's another. Continued. That's weird, same one twice. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn them into sentences. And these are gonna become what's called business rules. So when you're designing a database, you wanna list the business rules. Business rules are basically the rules that govern the data in the database. It has nothing to do with process. It has nothing to do with who does what. It has to do with how is the data managed by the database. So we could say a department is assigned an employee. A department is run by a supervisor. An employee belongs to a department. An employee works on a project. A supervisor runs a department. And a project uses an employee. So we took that big paragraph and figured out all the entities, and we figured out how they're connected by that chart. And now we draw the rough ERD. So you put in all the entities in rectangles, so you put in all the entities first, and then you use diamonds and lines uh, to do the relationships. Those are a few general examples. But here are the examples from that, and you can tell how old these pictures are, that these were actually scanned from paper originally. So an employee works on a project. You'll notice there's no cardinalities yet. We're just worrying about the relationship. A department is run by a supervisor. A department is assigned an employee. These are all the relationships we identified. So then if we put it all together, we end up with something that looks like this. So a supervisor, runs a department, or a department is run by a supervisor. A department is assigned an employee, or an employee is assigned to a department. An employee works on a project, and a project is well, worked on by a, an employee. So we now have everything we had in that paragraph graphed simply. This is known as a standard conceptual diagram. So um, also known as a Chen diagram. That's literally what these were called, these were Chen style diagrams. Um, and this is the simplest version of an ERD. This is great when you want to explain as a technical person, how the data is related to a non-technical person. Because you can take this to someone that doesn't know anything about computers and be, still be able to explain to them how the data is related. And after they understand, you know, what this these three symbols mean, the symbol, the line, and the symbol mean, they'll be able to read the whole diagram because it's simple to understand. Now we're gonna fill in our cardinalities because what's the point of an ERD if you don't know the rules? Each department has one supervisor because that's what the paragraph said. Each supervisor has one department. An employee can belong to one or more departments. Um, an employee has one or more, each department has one or more employees and each project must have one or more employees. A project, can have zero, or I mean an employee can have zero or more projects. So again, we worry about the one and only one, one or many, zero or many, zero or one. And we've seen these symbols before. And this is just another ex example of that, those cardinalities where A has an optional B, but a maximum of one, B must have an A and only one A. A can have, must have a B, but could have more than one B. And B here in this case could have an A or more than one A or none at all. So if we go back to our diagram, we have the following cardinalities. So a supervisor manages one and only one department. A department has one and only one supervisor. And by the way, yes, this is not a good diagram. It's not a good example, but it's a good example. It shows you all the pieces. A department is assigned one employee or more. Each employee could belong to one or more departments. An employee must belong to a department. They could work to more than one department. For example, at my day job, I belong to the web development group and the infrastructure group because I maintain servers as well as, you know, write web apps. So I belong to more than one department. Each employee could work on zero or more projects. They're on vacation. They just got hired. They haven't been assigned a project. 
but each project must always at least have one employee, otherwise it's a dead project. So therefore we don't allow a project to exist without an employee. All our cardinalities are filled in. And here's a few other examples. An instructor optionally teaches multiple classes. Each class is taught by one prof. You know, an employee could claim zero or more dependents. You know, an employee may have kids, may not have kids, may have a wife, may not have a wife. Insert combination of options here. And a customer is placed by an order and you can't place an order without a customer. So if now we're starting to fall into the land of what they call an extended ERD. So an extended ERD is you take a standard ERD and you start adding the attributes on. So in this case, we added on the primary keys. So we know that the supervisor has a supervisor number because the paragraph told you there was. The department has a name. It's the only thing we know about the department, that the department has a name. And we should have a primary key object. So if all we know is a name, guess that's our primary key. Uh, employee has an employee number and the project has a project number. We have that. So then we finish identifying the attributes. Um, we try to identify and name all the attributes essential to the system uh, without trying to match them to particular entities. So often what you'll do is you'll go through the paragraph, you'll identify all the attributes. If you're given a document, you know, you could be given like an invoice or some sort of document that it's an output from the system. You'll try to identify all the things on there that are attributes. And then so the uh, best way to do it is study the forms, files, and reports. Uh, you cross out things that aren't going to be transferred to the new system. Uh, extraneous items like signatures, like, you know, you have an invoice that got signed off that, yes, I promised to pay this bill kind of thing. We're not going to transfer the signatures because that doesn't go into the system or it didn't. Um, or there could be constant information that's the same for all instances. For example, name and address for the company. If it's the same across the board, we're probably not going to include that in the database. Maybe will, but not likely. Um, so basically, whatever you got left is what you're going to use. And then you're going to verify um, some of these with your system users. So you're going to take what you've identified. You can then go around and do a survey. And by survey, I mean you're going to sit down with them and talk. It comes as a shock that you're going to have to talk to people as a developer. But you will have to talk to people no matter what you want to do. So sometimes forms and reports out of date and you'll sit down with the user saying, hey, we noticed on here that there's a uh, uh, some code on this form that seems to be on every form. And then you talk, you sit down to the guy in ship and they go, yeah, we haven't used that in 10 years. It's just being filled automatically by the system. We, it means nothing. It's just automatic. So maybe you're not going to bring that one in. And then you take that piece of paper to someone and say, yeah, yeah, we're still using that. You got to find out what's still in use, what's not in use. Um, so in our paragraph, the only attributes we knew were the names of the department, project, and supervisor, and the employees, and their unique numbers. We've already identified that those were primary keys, so all we have left is names. So for each attribute, we need to match it with exactly one entity. Sometimes you'll have an attribute that belongs, looks like it should go to more than one entity. Um, you may need to add a modifier to it. For example, supervisor name and employee name. If you just had name, it could apply to both supervisor and the employee. So you might have to qualify saying, oh, this really is the customer's name or the employee's name, whatever. Um, and then you determine where that particular attribute should belong. Um, sometimes when you're done, you'll have a bunch of attributes left on your paperwork that doesn't belong to anything. So that usually means you either missed an entity, which happens, or uh, you missed a relationship. Like maybe there's you got something that's coming from somewhere else and you didn't realize that's how it worked. So then you end up having to identify these missed entities. So then you'll look at the data. You can't figure it out. You'll go talk to people, back to talking to people, and get them to tell you, well, where does this come from? Like, how does this get filled in? And they explain, oh, it was filled in by this process. And then you go find out how that process works. And you discover that that value actually belongs to, you know, whatever entity. Um, so then you'd add them to the relationship matrix. Anything you missed, add it to the relationship matrix, figure out how it's related to everything else, update your diagram with the new entities and the new relationships. So this, um, this grid's interesting because it's the same grid twice side by side. 
So you got an attribute department name, it belongs to the department, employee number belongs to the employee, employee name belongs to the employee, supervisor number and supervisor name belongs to the supervisor, project name, project number belongs to the project. So that's what we were able to extract out of that paragraph. So, and this actually skips a step, this diagram now, which I will be discussing in a moment. So here's our supervisor. Let's focus on this one for a second. So our supervisor has two attributes, supervisor name, supervisor number. Department name is also its primary key. Project has a number. Um, employee has an employee number and employee name. Uh, sorry, over here, employee number, employee name. Now you will notice that we've created two new um, entities on this one slide. And that's because we resolved the many-to-many -many relationship. If we go back to here, you'll notice that there's many-to-many -many here and many-to-many -many here. If we go over here, the many-to-many -many between department and employee is gone. They created a new table. So that there's no longer any many-to-manys. Same thing with the employee to project. A new entity was created to map that out. That's called resolving many-to-many -many relationships. Um, these, this table and this table, or these entities, are known as associative entities. It's an entity that associates two other entities. It's per, they're known also as bridge tables or as uh, reference ta cross-reference tables. Um, or I've even heard them as has and belongs to many tables. Yes. So essentially, this many to many, many relationship between two tables becomes three. And essentially, the way it works is, and it, I usually do this in my arm, so you know you got a many to many relationship, right? So you got your crow's foot at both ends. When you resolve it, you actually want the crow's foot to point to the middle, which is what happened here. So we went from the crow's foot on the outside to the crow's foot pointing in the middle so that it's one to many, one to many, not many to many. Again, if I go back to here, you'll see that many, many at both ends. So employee to department, that one is easy to read because you see it right here where you got the employee in the department so that the many is now pointing at the middle, not pointing at the outside. Now I've got two hands, he beat you. Well, the second an employee is hired, they're usually assigned to a department. And the way you'd assign it to a department was would be you'd add the employee here, and then you'd add the employee here with the matching department. You wouldn't need to add another department. You'd add the employee here. So that would allow you to have the employees and be able to modify the employees without having to modify the departments. You can modify the department without having to change the employees that work there. Um, I once worked for a company when I was doing my co-op a long time ago. Um, I worked in the MIS department. There's a phrase you don't hear anymore. So it was management information system, MIS. While I was there, it the name was changed to IT, information technology. None of us changed departments. Our department name changed. So that means that we could change the name of the department, which really in this diagram you couldn't, but you'd rename the department without reassigning employees. Or you could transfer an employee from one department to another department without having to touch the department. You just change the association between them. I'm actually pretty sure I've got other slides on this topic. But that is essentially how you would resolve the many-to-many -many relationship. In the conceptual diagram, this is completely valid, just, just saying. Like when you're doing conceptual, this is absolutely acceptable. This is if you happen to work with someone that doesn't allow you to do many-to-many -many in the conceptual. Normally you do this in the physical diagram, conceptual diagram, just saying. Like normally this associative entity here does not happen at this stage. It happens 
at the physical design stage. But it's a good time to talk about it because it's talking about, you know, how these uh, types of entities exist. Because these are regular entities, this is an associative entity. You will notice that in each of the associative entities that we have the primary key of the parent tables. So department name, employee number. That's its primary key. This is a compound key, which is the primary key. And they're also foreign keys. This is an everything key. So in this case, it's entirely possible to have a primary key that is a compound key that is also a foreign key, which makes this a very weak entity. Remember last week I spoke about weak entities? This is a weak entity and that is a weak entity because these cannot exist without values from their parent tables. So step 10, you check the ERD for results. So you look at it from a system owner user, does every, is everything clear? You try to, you know, make it, make you not understand the diagram. Like pretend you never saw this diagram before. Normally what my recommendation for that is finish your diagram on Friday, look at it on Monday. You've given two days for your brain to reset, right? To get out of the mode of what that diagram is. So give it two days, look at it. Does this still make sense? Is it clear? Yes or no? If it's not clear, obviously you need to go fix something. I uh, check the cardinality. Does it make the cardinality make sense? Um, then you check the attributes, make sure everything's aligned properly, make sure nothing's been omitted. Um, so now we want to go convert this to a physical diagram. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to take all the entities, you're going to convert them into tables. So an entity becomes a table. All the attributes become columns. The key attributes or the, become primary keys. Uh, anything that's multi-valued will end up becoming its own table. Because there could be cases where you have an attribute that's multi-valued on the conceptual side. You have to break it down into its own table because it's possible for something multi-valued. Um, composite attributes become separate columns. And you ignore derived attributes. Derived attributes are special. Derived attributes are attributes you can calculate. I think I spoke about that last week. Does that ring a bell? Because I can't remember if I told you guys or I told the other group. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So, yeah. You usually don't die. You do not include the derived attributes in the physical diagram. You could include them in the conceptual. You get rid of them in the physical. Then you assign them da data types that make sense. Um, and so, what if we take this diagram? It will become this in MySQL Workbench. In actual fact, it's not fantastic. Um, this example, because there's pieces missing. Um, and whoever diagrammed this originally did it wrong. That's kind of cool. Uh, this one's right. This one's right. This one's wrong. But sup supervisor is here. That goes to here. In actual fact, you know what? I'm going to diagram it for you guys so it's done right. So you have a proper example. Because I have time. That's not my mouse. Yep. So I'm going to do two pieces. Uh, I'm going to do two things. The first one I'm going to do is I just want to diagram in MySQL Workbench what we just did. So that you guys see a proper example. Um, so in MySQL Workbench, you just go uh, plus. You click on the model and you hit this. And it comes up with like that. We add a diagram. And um, so I'm going to throw in all four of my, uh, my initial entities that we identified. So this will be supervisor. And we have a, uh, a super... There was a supervisor number, which was the primary key. Yeah, that's that's okay. I can't spell. I can't type. Supervisors. Oh, God. And then na a supervisor name. And that's a Varkar. This one's the primary key. Going to leave that as Varkar at 45. Look, I didn't do lab one. My defaults are wrong. Um. I've had to reset my machine a few times. So there's supervisors. Uh, then we got departments. 
And this is department name. And it's going to be a Varkar. Helps if you type it in right. And it's the primary key. Yay, that's two. Um, I'm going to add, go down to my next one, which is employees. And we got employee number, which is the primary key, and employee, employee name. Good enough. Um, and we have projects. And we have a project number. And uh, let's pretend there's a project name because I can't remember if there is, but we're going to add it anyways. Okay. So here's our four tables. I'm going to close this. So we know that our supervisor department was one and one. And it's a one to one. Uh, and I clicked the wrong way. Of course I did. One to one. So the way MySQL Workbench does it is it'll create the foreign key automatically. And the way it works is you click on the child and you click on the parent. You'll see me do it backwards all the time because the diagram software I use at my day job is the other way around. So muscle memory does it the wrong way. MySQL Workbench is always, this table belongs to this table. Like this is the child of this table. First click is the child, second to, uh, click is the parent. So we know that we have employees and departments. So we know we know that's a many to many. So we click on department and employee. And in this case, it carried all kinds of crap down for us. And you can see that it carried all of it. Actually, let me go turn that around. I want to change this so that that relationship is non-identifying. There. Oh. This way. There we go. And now we do uh, many to many because I just didn't want the extra things. So you'll see right now that it's showing that it's one to many, one to many, uh, mandatory both sides. And then again, we had many to many employees to projects. However, the big difference was that an employee may not participate in a project. And in MySQL Workbench, you do it by double clicking on the relationship, hit the foreign key, and go. Uh, Mandatory, I think I got the right one. Yes, I did. So that's where you edit that in MySQL Workbench. So this is how that other diagram over here. Uh, where'd it go? Oh, it's over here. No, nope. here. This would look in MySQL Workbench. I'll even save it and add that to the uh, export as PNG. And that is uh, 8250 lecture two example, like such. Okay, yeah. It created the table automatically for the associative entity. So remember I was saying that it's physically impossible to create a many-to-many -many in a database, like in a modern database, like a real relational database. You cannot create many-to-many. -many. MySQL Workbench in version eight, before version eight, which was back then, version 5. They skip from 5 to 8 for whatever reason. Um, decided that, no, we we're not going to allow that in the diagram. So whenever you try to create a many-to-many, -many, it automatically creates a bit of table in the middle for you. So that's a group that's fantastic for that, that it'll create the bridge table automatically. If you try to do a many-to-many, -many, it won't. Other diagramming tools will allow you to, to do it. Um, and it'll look like this. Actually, I'll show it to you in a different tool, what the, another tool does. What are we doing? 
Stop doing that. Okay. You, uh, yes and no. You are, but, um, like this, like that, apply. So we've got this. And if I want to do a many to many, this software will let me draw it, as you can see, because this one lets you do it. And then you can, um, Somewhere in here, hang on. There's an option somewhere to convert. There. MySQL Workbench does this for you automatically. It does that extra step. So this, this tool's better for doing the, you know, way you do it in the conceptual diagram and then you do have to do convert it or you just get the software to do it for you automatically like MySQL Workbench does. Okay, so that's that one. Um, now, the other thing I want to show you guys is uh, uh, the probably the best um, conceptual diagramming tool I've ever used. So a lot of you guys have probably used stuff like uh, Draw.io or Visio or, you know, insert diagramming tool here to draw your diagrams. Uh, you will discover that the license for Visio that you're all given does not support ERD diagrams. Uh, years ago, when you used to get Office, actual Office, not, you know, Office 365, which was all on the web, the Visio actually lets you do ERD diagrams. The one that we now get to use, which is Visio on the web, no longer does. It has it. The school isn't paying for that license. So Visio, you're out of luck if you like using Visio or if you don't have an old version. However, this tool is fantastic because um, it's called ERDplus.com. It's free to use. Uh, you register. Um, I'll put links in the announcement so that, you know, you guys don't need to remember right away. Um, this software, this website was created by a couple of professors that wrote a textbook. Not the textbook, because you guys don't even have a textbook, but they have a uh, textbook that goes with this website. So if I create a new diagram, I'm going to call this uh, week two, create. And of course, it's going to be way at the bottom because it's alphabetical. We can drop our entities. So let's go employee. And this one's gonna be uh, departments. And on the department, we can add uh, department name. Okay, and that's unique. And the employee, we can add uh, employee number, which is unique. I'm going to add an attribute for employee name like that. And then I can connect one to the other. And there's my happy little diamond. And in here we can go uh, belongs, for example. And employee is um, mandatory many and the department is mandatory many because that's literally how our diagram was and that will let us do the exact same thing the other one had now what's really cool about this one is it supports the entirety of the conceptual diagramming standard so far you guys have seen four pieces the entity the attribute the relationship and the identifier right which is the underline What's nifty is this one supports all the other weird ones. So let's just say we want to go, we're going to add an attribute. Uh, we're going to put in age. And we say that one's derived. It'll actually mark it on there as a derived attribute. Uh, we can add another attribute called address. Now, we all know that addresses are composite. Human brains are special. I go, what's an address? You guys know automatically, I go, what's your address? You all, you all know that what I'm referring to is, this, well, most of you will know. I want to know what street, the city, the province, state, whatever, and a postal code, maybe a country. Because our brains know that's what makes up an address. It's a composite value in our brains automatically. Computers are stupid. They don't know. 
with that as composites, you have to tell it. So you can mark it as a composite, which is cool because it puts up a little, it puts on some parentheses. However, this diagram list software actually allows me to add in street, city, uh, province, postal code, and I can move these pieces around so that, you know, they're away from everything else. What's nifty now is that it, they all belong together. And this shows all the good ones. Now, let's say we have one more attribute on here that's optional. I don't know. Uh, cell number. We can mark that as an optional attribute. Say so puts it in, that's optional. So when you're doing the lab that requires you to do the to conceptual diagram, this tool does so much of the work for you. And it uses the right terminology. Whereas with draw.io, you're kind of fighting with what it has. Um, it's a great tool. Well, where I, I use it for my day job, whenever I need to do conceptual diagrams for our clients. That's not the account I use at my day job, but you know, that's, does a good job. And uh, yeah, I think that was it. Uh, that's the two tools that you needed to see. That's the end of week two. We're now caught up, which means next week's lecture should be about an hour, 10 minutes long, an hour, 50 minutes long, if I'm right. So from here on up for the rest of the term, most of the lectures will be pretty will be shorter, so you all get to go home that much earlier. Unlike the one that left after three minutes at the start of the class. But you know, that's okay. Exactly. <laughs>